Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Good Monday, Monday afternoon again. Hope you're doing well. Remember it's a marathon, not a sprint, as they say. How's life? Is it raining too much yet? No. Okay, so today uh, is our, another step along our journey to understanding and applying uh, project management best practices um, for your future in engineering, to be able to work on significant and interesting projects in teams and have the tool set and the understanding and critical eye, critical analysis to understand the projects in depth. So, um, the format of this, this is uh, a really important way of controlling projects. So we're really focusing on the execution phase of the project life cycle. Remember we've been considering the define phase, the initial stages, so we looked at define, we've looked at planning, we've looked at scheduling. Um, in particular, you know, we started off with an introduction and projects have to align with strategy. We select projects based on a decision-making method in conjunction with expert judgment. You can't just rely on abstract models to do everything. You've got to synthesize with the complexity of experience and know-how of people. Then we went on to talk about breakdown structures. And we talked about an initial scope statement which had objective. And we started to talk about high level specifications, high level concepts, product breakdown structure, work breakdown structure as part of that, part of our project definition. Then we started to talk about this, uh, this network diagram, which is our planning. We're starting to talk about planning on when are we going to do things and what activities are we going to do in terms of consisting of different work packages. But essentially, we've got activities in a network diagram which is connected by these predecessor relationships and also we've got these activity durations and then we started to talk about resources didn't we that was our final say I think last time we were talking about resources and if we could level the resources it would be better as a rule of thumb in terms of improving management so we got less chance of high impact events and it's easier to manage a leveled resource in a project and a portfolio of projects. And we, and we also mentioned something called critical chain, which is about thinking about a critical resource, something which is rare and under demand and how you have to think about not just the critical path but the critical chain where you have to look at that resource availability and whether it's compromised in parallel activities. So we talked a little bit about that, actually. I think we'll catch up about that in maybe lectures, uh, lecture six, just a little bit more, um, just, for, just for completion state. Anyway, so, earned value. So I'm going to talk about earned value today. I'm going to describe what it is in preparation for your tutorial next week, which is on the Friday, 
And earned value, it's a popular exam question um, because it's very quantitative, but it also talks a lot about project management principles and, again, that critical analysis of projects and what can happen in a qualitative sense. So what do we intend to do today? We want to talk about what earned value management is, and then there's this seven-step seven process, how we do earn value, and then there's a bunch of, let's say, equations emerging out of that, lots of, lots of different equations and variables which are used in the project control activity. That's the kind of thing we're going to be talking about. I've got, a few, I've got a few multiple choice questions to test you as well along the way. So we, we, uh, we, we talked about work packages and then going from there to a network diagram, we've got these activities. Uh, we can assume work packages and activities are the same for simplicity. I remember we had this organizational breakdown structure. Do you remember we matched the work packages to the organization? Do you remember that? So we had this kind of matrix in a way. We had the work packages and the parts of the organization. And what we did, we linked up responsible people to work packages so they're responsible for the budget of that work package, which is essentially an activity with resources, with a duration, and resource profile. So we did that and we had these cost account codes uh, at work package level. So therefore in our company financial system we have these list of cost account codes which are linked to work packages which are linked to our project plan and we're able to track costs as they are expended, as costs are spent in the project, we're able to see them in the finance system, assuming there's no delay. In the real world, there may be some delay in terms of data entry, these different things which we'll just ignore for the time being. So we've got these cost account codes. So we've got cost information as the project progresses. We've got a budget. We've got our plan. We've got our timeline. So we've got our plan, we've got our schedule, we've, got, we've said when we're going to do something, we've said when people are going to do something, how many people are going to do something. So we've got a duration, we've got the people, the resources I should say, and we have an ongoing project and we're able to say, look, we've spent so much money. So from that situation, we can then go towards controlling a project using earned value. So basically our plan is called a performance measurement baseline because we've got a baseline against which we can measure the performance of the project as it progresses. And you can notice a few things. We've got, we've got an actual cost so we can go to our finance system and say what we're actually spending. And then we've got a scheduled cost. So what's the scheduled cost? What do you think that is? So the scheduled cost is how much we said we would spend by a certain date. So based on our plan, if I went to my project plan, it was, no, it was November, November the 5th. Like um, and I looked on the plan, I should be able to say how much money I budgeted to spend by that date. And that's the budgeted, of, the budgeted cost of work scheduled. So our plan says on the schedule that we would spend so much money by a certain date, which doesn't necessarily have to be the same amount of money we've spent based on how well we're doing. So the finance system is our link to reality. Our plan is our abstract, this is what we're going to do. We've done our best, we've been quite thorough. 
We've used all our resources, we've talked to everyone, historical information, we've had meetings, we've followed a, a set process, we've got all sorts of reviews. We're happy we've got our best plan, we've done our best we possibly can. And we said we're going to spend certain amounts of money by certain dates all along the plan. You can track them in terms of the amount of act the duration of the activity and the amount of resource which is on their activity. So we could do that as a detailed estimate, 20 days, two, two people a day, simple thing like that. You could work out how much money we said we'd spend and we could break it down. We could say, well, uh, we're going to spend so much on procuring materials in December. On December the 10th, we'll receive that. So we'll spend on then and so on. So we've got real detailed information about our resource consumption, as much as possible. Um, and we've got our finance system saying how much, how much was spent as well. But that's not the full picture, because that's, so that's actual cost and budgeted, and budgeted cost of work scheduled. What about the actual work we've done? So let's say Let's say we were assembling one Rolls-Royce engine and we said we planned, we planned to do that during October, November, December and we've got our plan and we're, we're tracking our cost as well, how much we spent, but when we get there, yep. Okay, okay. So then, we're tracking the cost, we, we, we've got our plan, and then we go on site in November, middle of November, and from experience you notice not much work has been done. So therefore, we can look at the work which has been performed and think, not much work has been done here. In fact, um, I'm going to measure the amount of work performed by using the concept of budget. So the amount of work I've performed on this engine, I would only have budgeted, uh, it looks like, you know, they, would only, they only should have spent 10% of the budget. So that's the budgeted cost of work performed. So I'm able to see or make some sort of judgment about how much work has been done. And this is a contentious point in earned value because of uncertainty and the amount we can say about projects and the amount we can say about projects to, in, to any level of detail because it costs money effort to know as much as you can about a project in detail you can never know the precise details of how a project is progressing because it just costs so much money there's the uncertainty yep. It depends on the industry as well. It's not just uncertainty, there's complexity as well. Sometimes things are so complex, it's difficult to say something for sure. If, if it's a small project, then perhaps you wouldn't use earned value because it's very easily understood. It's when you get into a particular zone of particular types of projects where earned value has the most utility. Um, when I worked at National Grid, you could say, what, what could you say? It's very difficult to say things in detail. Um, if you say, if you're excavating a hole in the middle of London to try and get to a high pressure valve, it's very difficult to say how much of that excavation was complete for all sorts of um, operational reasons which perhaps is uncertainty, is that you don't know for sure whether the valve will be there in the first place 
um, whether you've excavated enough, whether the excavation will require lots of reinforcement and extra design as well. You have to design an excavation. You might need lots of safety operative staff. You can only do work when there are safety operative staff available. They may not be available. They might, might not be enough capacity. And all of a sudden you find you have to turn off the gas somewhere. You can't find the valve. You have to make another excavation 50 meters down the road and can't find that valve either. Um, there's even things like uh, um, some of the stuff in gas distribution has been around since the 70s and people have built chip shops over the top of gas, gas uh, pipes when they weren't supposed to. There's the kind of legal agreements and sometimes where there was a valve in 1970 someone's put a roundabout. <laughs> so, uh, there's all sorts, so there's all sorts of really complex and uncertain things going on in work in projects and it's not very intuitive and straightforward to say how much work has actually been completed and you can only say how much something is going to cost to a certain level as well. So it's those sorts of issues which makes earn value useful but also contentious because you can't, you're kind of moving the problem around in project management. You can't know everything. If, if, I, if I was set to, to build detailed cost estimates for everything in, in a company, I just wouldn't have the time. Uh, in the automotive industry, people would say, if only they had more cost engineers, they could take so much more cost, cost reduction out of a out of motor vehicle, but they're a limited resource. You can only do so much. So that's the reason, that's one of the principal background reasons why earned value is effective in some cases and, in, and, and redundant in others. If it's a simple project, it's pointless really, in some sense. Um, and on the other side of the coin, if it's, if it's completely vague and difficult to define and intangible, then you're not able to get useful information and it becomes difficult on the other side of the range. So we've got this, we, we kind of dealt with the slides I was trying to go through, <laughs> I'll be going through anyway, which was good. And um, So as I was saying, the, the thing is, is to, we've got this actual cost, the budgeted cost of work scheduled from the plan, and then the actual work which has been done, for which you would kind of, kind of guess, well, if we'd have got this far, it would have cost this. And that would be the budgeted cost of work performed, as best as you can. And sometimes it's difficult to say precisely how much work has been done in vague and, un and uncertain and complex situations, um, maybe in, in terms of software, electronics, where industries where, which are known to be volatile and uncertain and subjective as well and dependent on the skill um, and expertise of, of, of workers where it's difficult to say whether work is complete or not. Maybe in a research and development project um, if you're trying to, trying to develop a new manufacturing technology it's difficult to say how, how successful you're being, how much time is left. So there's this uncertainty, which is, which is a, a kind of a linchpin, I guess. And so EVM is a method for integrating the scope of work, the schedule, and resources. And it compares the plan to the actuals, like so. So I guess the good thing about EVM is that it promotes this repeatability. This is what project management is all about. It's trying to promote science and engineering in a difficult arena. So earned value is a scientific method and it promotes discipline in terms of, in terms of estimating and collecting data. And that's an interesting rule here, is that typically when a project is only 15 to 20 percent complete, uh, if actual project performance is better or worse than originally planned. 
So evidence suggests the percent overrun at the 20% completion point will be within 10% of the percent overrun at project completion, with things typically getting worse. So it's an early, an early run indicator. Um, things tend to deteriorate rather than improve lots of the time, although you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a given. So here's where we should use earned value, as we were just talking about. So we've got, to be, we've got to pick the right projects. So you don't want to spend lots of time collecting data if it doesn't give you any benefit. I think the F-16 program in America talked about stopping data collection, which was really, really contentious because uh, all contractors in the US government would have had no data or visibility um, for, for projects going forward to base their predictions on. So one of the hidden benefits of earned value is it sets the scene, it gets you historical cost data for the next generation of projects, of, of, of aircraft, civilian, defence, uh, whatever. So these are the things where EVM is useful because of the ability to say something about progress in terms of what we talked about, in terms of how much work has been done and what the budgeted cost of that work would have been or is for that particular work compared to how much you said you would do on that date compared to the actual cost. So you want things which are longer in duration, so you don't want simple projects and you want something where you do have strict budget limits because we're using lots of budgeted cost information in our own value. If you notice, the values, the central values are actual cost, which is cost, budgeted cost of work scheduled, which is cost, budgeted cost of work performed, which is cost. So it's all the same unit. And when you form ratios, it becomes unitless in some sense. So it's all based on cost information in some way. And you have also minimal dependence on other things, so they can't be externally uh, disturbed by other, other things which are not in the performance measurement baseline. So we wouldn't use EVM when we've got intangible benefits which are difficult to define, difficult to measure, difficult to say things about. There's this, there's this uncertainty and complexity or things which are immediately short in duration and things which are difficult to say in terms of objectives. So the fundamental thing is it's difficult to provide some sort of definitive measurement. So this is what I've basically been outlining to you. Earned value uses the performance measurement baseline, which is your, um, the plan you've developed with activities, resources, durations. And it has these three cornerstones. It has this, it has this actual cost in your finance system, sometimes termed, termed accruals. Uh, this, is, this is sometimes understood by some people in industry, wrongly or rightly or wrongly, I think perhaps wrongly, as classical cost engineering, where, where you've, got, um, you've got people who are monitoring accruals, how much money is being spent, and inputting that, that data into finance systems like ERP systems, or some, sometimes the oil and gas industry, they don't like the enterprise resource planning system because it's a, a big unwieldy software system, they prefer, say, something like Kiljummy Cost Manager, which is something developed by BP. They're based in the Shetlands, know them quite well. But that's a really classic, uh, dedicated system to collect actual costs, which is more manageable on projects than a centralised ERP system, which is for a major organisation. So something like Kiljummy Cost Manager could be used to 
to collect actual costs. And then you've got the budgeted cost of work scheduled, which is basically you would say you would do this on this date. You planned to do this. You said, you know, this based on reasonable assumptions and a basis of estimate. But anyway, you, you, you said you would do that. And then there's the earn value. So how much work has actually been done? How much of my software is finished? How much of the engine has been assembled? How much of the new technology has matured to technology readiness level, prototype level, depending on what the project is? So it's those three things which enable us to, to work out whether the project is under control or not. Okay, let's break this up a little bit. Let's see if you're awake. So, uh, if you want to try the multiple choice question, there's a, there's a number for this, uh, for this session. I'm, I'm just trying to get you used to engaging with multiple choice questions because you do have a 50% of your exam is MCQ, multiple choice questions. One of the drawbacks of earned value is people are incentivized to give you positive. Another, another point about um, how much work has actually been done, if you were to go on site or go to the facility or where the project is taking place, people, sometimes people are incentivized to give you the positive spin, you know, the, the really optimistic, positive view of the project. No one, no one wants to look bad in front of anyone, in front of management or, or anything. And also people, people have their performance development review, their PDR, linked to uh, performance objectives in their role. And if their project is behind schedule, they won't get their bonus. Now in the, in the oil and gas industry, for some contractors, are particularly suspicious about this. And you know, we'll name it as okay. Are we getting, are we getting the correct information from the project to enable us to keep it under control? So thank you to those who have, who have taken part. Yes, it's both are true. Now the thing is, is that the terminology, the planned value. I think here on the left, the earned value and planned value. That's the Americanism. That's, that's from the States, but it means the same as the planned value is a budgeted cost of work scheduled, and the earned value is a budgeted cost of work performed. Now, the Americanism is more intuitive. It makes sense. Whereas, I guess the, the other version is more precise in its terminology. So that's something to be aware of. Okay, can you remember which one? Which one's the best?
Okay, good. Majority of majority are right. Yeah. Okay, so we have this we have this seven step process. How do we how do we carry out an EVM? So some of these things I've already said and things we've already done. So clearly you develop your DBS, WBS, you develop the schedule, the network diagram, you pay attention to resource loading in terms of uh, smoothing and, and this critical chain effect where you have to manage the critical resource, the availability of the resource, which is very rare. Might be a specialist programmer, specialist designer. It's interesting in design, the work in design can be quite uncertain and variable. Coming back to our point about how to, how to work out how much work has been done. Now you could have someone with 30 years experience in CAD systems and simulation and all sorts of things, and someone who's got two or three years experience, who's worked on less, less projects, therefore has less, perhaps, uh, innovative um, experience. So the more experienced designer can innovate, and the less experienced designer comes up with perhaps less creative solutions in longer time. So you assign your resource and then you, then you work out, okay, because of all this uncertainty and complexity and how work happens in reality, we've got these different strategies for saying how much has actually been done. And there are particular reasons for that. So we try to simplify it. Now sometimes it's, it doesn't make sense to say 35% has been done, 38% has been done. It's just very difficult to say. You know, when you inspect work or try to work out how much has been done, in some, in some instances, say, if you're procuring something, you only spend when you receive, you receive the procured goods from the supplier. So you kind of spend at the end of the work package. So you only, it's a particular situation which you need to have some sort of strategy for saying how much work has been done. So then you have your performance measurement baseline, which I've already talked about. And then you start to collect the, uh, the costs and look at the plan, the work performed. And you're able to uh, use all these different equations and ratios to try and infer something about is the project in control or not. So it's all ratio dates, all ratios, and you'll see there's cost performance index, schedule performance index. Um, there's estimated cost at completion, bushly cost at completion, likely remaining estimate um, to complete performance index, different things, all these different ratios which, uh, which mean something in terms of uh, project control. So we need, we need to just say a few things in particular, precisely, just to remind ourselves about the work breakdown structure. Like so. So we've got the tasks and the work packages. It's a time phase budget. So, you know, we, we can look at our network diagram and see when the work package, when the activity is going to start, sorry, when the activity is going to start and how much resource is on it. Remember, we've leveled the resource in some way. There's something to be aware of. There's something called planning packages. Now, sometimes this is where, if you've got, come back to our initial point about not being able to know everything in detail about things, if you've got a long-term project, then work packages in the future, it's common not to know much about them because they depend on the detail being developed early on in the project. The classic thing is design. You might be manufacturing something, and it might be, you know, you always manufacture this type of thing in a certain way, but you've not designed it yet in detail, so you don't precisely know the process, the manufacturing process plan. In other words, 
How are you going to do it in principle? You don't know, so therefore you can't create a production schedule. So there are some work packages in what one year, two year, three year going onwards where you're just going to have to say, we only know so much about this to a higher level. Uh, and these things are called planning packages because they have to be planned yet in detail. And this is called the rolling wave effect, where you've, you've just got, say, a part of the project plan, which is you've kind of got an estimate of duration and an estimate of cost, but not much, not much else. No detail in there, no particular activities, no particular resource loading on these different things. So this is in the longer term part of the project. That's, that's important to recognise. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So I'll be posting these slides on the Blackboard system directly after. Yes, these slides. Yeah, the, yeah, these these slides and the written the written document have enough information for you to for you to be tested on. There's no there, no there'll be no tricks or uh, uh, or anything like that. So it should be should be consistent with the past exam papers as well. Okay to, so. so I think the point is with the schedule, it has to be realistic. If you uh, provide yourself something which is, um, let's say, really optimistic or difficult to do, and that can be reflected in your um, duration estimates. Or work packages and activities. And then we use our resource loading principles and match our work packages to our control account managers. So all of this we've already said and understand. And then we have this thing. So there's a number of strategies to do with measuring the performance because of our uncertainty. So they, they try to simplify things as much as possible. Um, so that means either for long duration tasks, for instance, if you've got quite a long duration where there's cost and time, and there's a risk management term called exposure, which is the amount of um, uncertainty in the cost um, and time, for example, which is a, a risk management term. Um, so if you've got long duration, quite high cost, then it's common practice to, to agree up front on saying, by the time we get to this part, say, in, in assembling our engine, by the time we get to this part in designing our nuclear reactor, by the time we get to this part in building the material characterization unit of a nuclear power plant, then we're going to say that 30% of our work has been done, for example. And then by the time we get to this later part, we're going to say, okay, now we've, we've got to 70%. And then at the very end you say, okay, now we've got to 100%. So sometimes in those situations you're able to have an upfront agreement on saying only when we get to this point can we say we've done so much percentage. And because it doesn't make sense to say 
24% and so on, it's just, it's just um, infeasible to say something to that precision. And the implications of that in terms of, because you're reporting cost information, and reporting cost information in the business is really, really important. You, know, you, you, don't, you don't take it lightly. When you're dealing with costs in a business, it's, it's, you know, it's a central lifeblood of organisations, even economies and, and the UK and so on. So you're never light with cost information. You've got to be very serious in all, in all respects in terms of non-disclosure, all sorts of things. So if you're, if you're trying to claim something which is very difficult to claim or say precisely, then these strategies do away with that. There are also some times where uh, if the project is, if the actual activity is not complete, then you just give it a zero. Um, that's another strategy. Or you've got the 50-50 rule, where it's either 50% or 100% and you don't say anything in between. Um, there are different ways of upfront saying, okay, how much work have we, have we done because of this, because of the uncertainty, complexity and, and difficulty with projects. And we're doing that because we want to reduce the subjectivity to a minimum and be consistent and predictable in our project control decisions. That's why we do something like that. So we got some particular strategies there. The incremental milestones is where you, you pick particular points in the actual development of the project and say, okay, if we get to this point in the work, then we say we're so much percent complete. So it's this, it's this predefined points in performance where you're able to say something, and this has been agreed by all experts. There are some instances where it's easier to say something, like the level of effort. You might be, pay, you might be paying someone just to be somewhere, like in a highly automated factory. You might just, be, might just have a resource on site, just there. So if the, if the project has started, then after 10 days, there's been 10 days worth of effort in terms of labor. So that's this kind of level of effort um, thing where it's very predictable, very straightforward, and it's linked to time. So that's another way of measuring accomplishments. So all these things bring together the performance measurement baseline with our rolling wave concepts, detailed plans, and so on. But that's not completely the case here in terms of, in terms of something called the contract budget base. So this is our basic situation. So we've got this uh, project control, performance measurement baseline, um, yeah, we've got the WBS, we've got the plan, we've got the resources, we've got actual costs, we've got plan value, we've got earn value, or the other more precise terms, and we've got ways of saying, because of the uncertainty and difficulty of saying how much work has been done, we've got strategies for that, which we've agreed up front, because of the nature of the work. And we've done all that. Now here, just to show you a bit of a, a breakdown of where we are. So we've got the overall price of the project. We've got the, something called the contract uh, budget base. This is the fee or the profit. So we're not considering that. That's outside of the contract budget base, like so. And now there's our performance measurement baseline. So we've been, you know, that's what we've developed, isn't it? All our work up to date in here has been the performance measurement baseline. But what's this here? Management reserve. Now that's a new thing, indeed. 
So the management reserve is something for unanticipated work which is still in scope, is its definition. But essentially, it, it, it's a pot of money which has been allocated and it will be based on historical amounts of management reserve required in the past, perhaps in other things there will be a basis of that allocation, but it's basically there for when things we can't anticipate happen, unknown unknowns, things we don't know we don't know. Uh, the, fa the famous Donald Rumsfeld speech years ago, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, there are unknown unknowns, there are things we don't know we don't know. And if they impact the scope, our management reserve is there to bail us out when these things happen. So the management reserve is there as a, it's a type of, it's a type of risk budget. It's for things we can't, which were unanticipated. Now you will see in risk management, risk management has, tries to anticipate things which may or may not go right or wrong. They try to anticipate events, things which may or may not happen. So that's, that's a specific type of risk. The management reserve is an, is an unanticipated unknown which affects scope. So it's an unknown unknown, unanticipated. Risk management would say, okay, we've got known unknowns, we can actually model them and put them in the estimate. So it's this, it's this unanticipated occurrence. So this management reserve is there to help us out when things go wrong which are unanticipated. We've got our performance measurement baseline which has all our information in for the plan. Then we've got our distributed budget which is in our control accounts. And look, we've got work packages and planning packages where we're waiting for more detailed information. And here we've got undistributed budget but we know we're going to need it and it's for a particular type of uncertain work which we need to include in the project. So we've got these, this basic breakdown of stuff in our price. Like so, so we usually like to like to test the knowledge around this space at times as well. Okay, here's another question. They're just, they're just informal, just to test you. Just, uh, I think, I think, as long as you're thinking about it, is the is the important thing. As long as you're thinking about the question, keeping your mind active. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it is open book if you want. <laughs> I, think, I think the thing is, is that uh, the more you're solving problems, the, the more you learn. It's best to, best to try and answer questions. 
to drive, to drive your learning. Okay, do you remember the Do you remember this? Okay, it's five to four, so I'll give you five minutes of a, of a break, short break, then we're, we're going to go through the equations, and what they mean and how, how the calculations work. So that's the kind of engine room of earned value and what they mean. So we're kind of, we're kind of back online at about four o'clock, so a short break. Yeah, of course. Uh, when I'm doing the diagram for me, so the arrows are crossing each other and the construction is wrong. How can I do that? Um, so, I don't think it should matter if the arrows are crossing, it's just a bit, maybe a bit untidy or confusing in presentation. Yeah. But it shouldn't matter the. If I can follow the arrows, I, I don't mind whether they cross or not. I mean, in terms of in terms of aesthetics or presentation, you know, I guess uh, that's important. But in terms of marks for an exam, I wouldn't I wouldn't knock off marks for for presentation or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I draw that, but uh, 15, for example, must be there, but the arrow crossing that. Uh, okay, yeah, no, no, it's okay. No, 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 it's all right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah it's all right. You'll find, like, you know, uh, people crossing lines out and all sorts of things. Yeah.
Okay, so I think we started off saying what the actual costs, the actual cost was, which is, you know, there's, there's been some work performed, so we got some actual costs, our accruals we've incurred. So what's our budget at completion? We got some, we got some of these three letter acronyms all over in value management. Um, I do apologise for that in advance. They're all, uh, all, all these, uh, yeah, all these uh, abbreviations. The budgeted, the budgeted cost at completion is basically how much you've budgeted for the project. So it's your, it's your performance measurement baseline. It's your, it's your baseline plan for everything. So your budgeted cost at completion is everything. Then you've got these other things here. You've got the latest revised estimate. So what's that all about? So obviously you've got your plan, what, what we said we'd do, we've got the actual costs, and we've got how much work has actually been done, has been performed, and what the budget of that work is, would have been, is, not the actual scheduled budget. So the actual budgeted cost of work performed. So things are not going entirely to plan at times. So the latest revised estimate is, say, from your supplier, your contractor, and it's their estimate. It's their, on their side of the fence, they've looked at progress, and they've said, OK, we're doing some analysis, and here's our latest revised estimate for the project, based on current progress. So that's outside. That's, that's our outside kind of a contractor supplier view. But we've also got the estimate, estimated cost at completion, which is basically um, the, same, the same concept but from a different calculation. That's from our earned value data. So we can, see, we can say how much have we done in terms of the earned value data and then do some sort of calculation to do an estimated cost at completion. And you'll see the equation for that. But we've also got this latest revised estimate, which is external, which is from the supplier. So what have we got? So we've got, basically we've got variances going on. Now remember, actual cost, earned value and plan value are all in cost. They're all measured in cost. So based on that, we can define some, some level of difference between the plan and what has been performed. So the schedule variance and the cost variance are some of the most popular things. And Here's the equations. So the schedule variance is a difference between the budgeted cost of the work performed minus the budgeted cost of the work scheduled, or earned value minus plan value. So this is the, the budget for the work we've actually done minus the planned budget. And that's our schedule variance. Two things, two cost values. And our cost variance is a budgeted cost of work performed minus the actual cost of work performed. So that's the earned value minus the actual cost. So one is from the schedule world and one is from the cost world. So those variances will tell us what? What do they tell us? So if we'd have, if we'd have done more work then we set out in the schedule, then this would be positive. If we'd have done more work in terms of budget, which cost of work performed, rather than what we spent on the work performed, then we'd have done more work again. So as you can see, a positive value for schedule variance and cost variance is good. You know, well, 
is a positive thing. A negative thing means we're behind in the schedule, we're behind in how much we're spending. I guess, I guess on projects, you can look at things in different ways. You could say, okay, we seem to be ahead. Um, but we don't seem to have spent much money in terms of the work performed. That's the cost world. Or we seem to be... Um, positive in terms of what we said we were doing the plan. We need to investigate why things are positive. They could be an underlying negative reason for all this. Okay, so, so I guess these things are, are particularly important. The budgeted cost of work performed, or the earned value minus the plan value, is really saying from a schedule point of view, well, how far have we got compared to where, where we would say we'd be on a particular date? And the earned value minus the actual cost is basically saying, okay, you know, we've done this amount of work, how much have we actually spent? Have we spent too much to get this far? Or have we spent too little? If we spent too little to get that far, then that's a positive, because we're not, you know, we've spent not much money and we've done a lot of work. I always like the Americanism because it's quite intuitive, earned value, so how much, how much work, how much has value has been earned by doing work, and the plan value being, okay, this is how much work we plan to do, so that's, the earned value and plan value are more intuitive, easier to get your head around. So some other things here, we've got the variance at completion. And we've got the budgeted cost of work remaining. So the difference between the planned budgeted cost at completion and the expected cost to complete the work. So remember our budgeted cost at completion is what we budgeted to do the entire project. And based on our, remember based on our current performance, we've made some sort of prediction of the expected cost at completion. So what's the difference between where we're going to be based on our performance and what we budgeted for, well, that's called the variance at completion. And the cost accounting world, sometimes you see the word variance and it just means there's a difference. There's a difference between two values. In the world of statistics, it means square of the standard deviation. That's, not, that's really, not, really not what we're talking about at all. So a variance in the cost accounting world just means just means there's a difference. So the variance at completion you can see there is from two perspectives. One is from the outside thing from the supplier, the likely remaining estimate, and one is from our performance data, our, our own value data, which is the estimated cost at completion. Now the estimated cost at completion, there's a, there's a formula for that coming up, and we'll just, we'll just look at that in a little bit more detail. So you've got two views there, like so. Now the budgeted cost of work remaining is the budgeted cost at completion minus the budgeted cost of work performed. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? Because the budgeted cost at completion is what we said we were spending in entirety, and the budgeted cost of work performed is how much we budgeted to do what we've actually done. You've just got to read these things a few times to begin to, begin to get the handle. So therefore that's got to be the budgeted cost of work remaining. So our, our whole, whole piece of the pie minus the piece of the pie we've actually done. And that's the budgeted cost of work remaining because we're talking about the budgeted cost. It makes sense. Checking something. 
Okay, so there, here's our first ratios. CPI, cost performance index, and schedule performance index. So these things um, compare a ratio there of budgeted cost to actual cost. And budgeted cost, work performance, and budgeted cost of work scheduled. So you want them to be one if they agree with each other. You want them to be, you know, if, if our plan was reasonable at the start, we assume it is. It's best, our best, our best plan. And we want those two things to agree. The budgeted cost of work performed and the actual cost of work performed. We want them to match up. The budgeted cost of work performed and the budgeted cost of work scheduled, from a scheduled perspective, we want them to match up as well. So that means our schedule is in line with what we've done and our spend is in line with what we've done as well. So if, if those, those things match up, then our indices should be one and everything's great. However, if you've done more work um, than you actually spent, that's greater than one. If you've done more work than you said you would do by a certain date, in, that, in, the, in the sense we have there, in the ratio, so that's above one. And in that sense, it's a positive. It's almost like a, an improved efficiency. So that's, that's kind of confirmed. Why is that? Well, it's because, you know, if you reason with it, if you've got earned value being greater than the actual cost, then every time you spend one pound, you get more back. And it's the same from the schedule view as well. Every time, every time you spend one pound, in terms of the plan, you get more back in terms of where you are in the plan. So both of them being above one is good. Both of them being above one is good. There's something to, if you tracked, if you track the CPI and SPI ratios, which are one, you know, round about one, then as you get further on in the project, you can see that those ratios are dealing with larger and larger numbers and perhaps become less and less sensitive to changes in the, in the project. So early on, you know, if you're dealing with ratios, they can become more pronounced. But as time goes on, you get this uh, uh, ongoing, almost dampening of the, of the impact of things because the, the numbers are getting a uh, higher magnitude, so therefore the ratio changes, changes in, it, in any of those numbers in the ratio, uh, you're dealing with larger numbers, so any changes don't show up as much as a percentage of the other. So as you go further on in the project, if you kind of tract it around one, as it kind of, these ratios go up and down, then they will kind of diminish, diminish in pronouncement. You've got to be aware of these these, these kind of subtleties. So remember we talked about estimate at completion. Estimate at completion is using our earned value management data to make a prediction of what the forecasted cost at completion is going to be. And we can do that using the CPI and SPI ratios using these particular equations. Now the thing is, the estimated cost at completion, okay, you know, based, on, based on our current performance, how much, is it, how much is it going to cost us to complete the project? Well, if you consider the cost performance, the CPI index, then you can kind of say, okay, we're going to use the CPI forecast to create our estimated cost at completion. We can also use an equation which includes both, both of these things, which is uh, 
um, a multiplicative effect of both the cost and the schedule view of earned value. So in that way, you, you've kind of got you kind of got a so-called best case and worst case. So in the first in the first situation, you're using the CPI index as as part of the equation in terms of uh, adjusting the budgeted cost at completion based on, if you look at the CPI, based on this ratio. So if you write that down, you'll see it makes sense to extrapolate using the CPI to get beyond the budgeted cost at completion or change the budgeted cost at completion based on the current cost performance. If you included the SPI as well, things usually get worse because if your cost is in a bad position, so is your schedule, typically. But it doesn't have to be the case. It's just usually they're both, they're both out of kilter. Then your estimated cost at completion is somehow worse because you're, uh, you're including your, both your poor cost performance and your poor schedule performance. Or both your good cost performance and good schedule performance on these things. Well, because you're combining both cost and schedule in this equation through the, through the ratios, which if you write out the SCPI and SPI and put, plug them into these equations, it kind of, you can see it's an extrapolation of the budgeted cost at completion to get a new estimated cost at completion based on whether you're spending more or less, based on whether you're doing well or not on the... Uh, on the project schedule. And finally, so we're getting to the end of the getting to the end of the equations, which we're going to practice next week. So we're going to be applying these next week in the tutorial. Um, we've got this to, co to complete performance index. from the point of the budgeted cost at completion or the likely remaining estimate. So that's our final, our final ratio which we're going to be dealing with next week in the tutorial. So earned value has this um, you know, it's a project control method with a particular methodology. It utilizes the performance measurement baseline and you've got this breakdown of, of the project price in terms of um, contract budget base and the other things. And we develop these different, different values from the actual cost, the plan value and the earned value to give us really estimates of these different things, the various uh, complete, the budgeted cost of work remaining. And they basically use ratios to adjust percentage increase or a percentage decrease in the main to adjust values you know to find out things like estimated cost of completion and to complete performance index, different things like that. So they're all, they're all adjustments using these ratios. Okay, so we're going to practice these next week in the tutorial and carry out some calculations and get to grips with the particular implications of these values. Now the thing is, is that all projects run into problems. So you could try and re-baseline a project if things get really bad. There might be all sorts of reasons for that in terms of poor planning in the first place or something just goes dramatically wrong. Maybe we've been hit by a pandemic. You know, something terrible happens. If there's something like an engineering change, if there's a change of scope, 
then that should be fed through to the plan and the plan change. That could be a change in customer requirement, uh, for example. So there are engineering changes going on at the same time, which changes the scope of your plan, but they should be documented and the plan updated and everything updated. Now the thing about earned value is it does need this, this data, this information to update the system. So therefore, you know, you can be incentivized to provide this wrong data. It also costs money to implement as well. But there is this propensity to be optimistic sometimes, and it, it brings in social pressures um, and other human factors in terms of, in terms of collecting data. So the, yeah, so the engine room is these, the actual cost, the earned value, and the plan value. The, the CPI and SPI indices, the budgeted cost at completion, and then you've got these, these things which are derived, like the estimated cost at completion. There's a likely remaining estimate, which is from the supplier, and that can be used to create an a, uh, estimate of cost at completion as well, or a variance at completion. And then there's, there's a few more complicated things in terms of um, looking at the CPI and CPI SPI forecast of estimate at completion, which is quite a complicated expression, but it's really using those indices as a as as really a, a, a basis of just adjusting just in existing existing budget at, budget at cost at completion number. Um, and it's called the worst case, sorry, the best case and the worst case, because in the CPI world, okay, you're adjusting your estimated cost at completion, but also if you include the CPI and the SPI, if the CPI is bad, the SPI tends to be bad as well. So it's, it's termed a worst case there because you're combining both, both poor effects. But it can, it can, it doesn't necessarily have to be a worst case. It's just, that's just a kind of... Uh, uh, an expression which experienced people have put to it because it tends to be, it tends to be a worst case, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Because your cost performance could be poor, but your scheduled performance might be good. And remember these CPI and SPI ratios, so 10% um, is considered significant in terms of moving away from one. And you can track these CPI and SPI numbers and as you know, as a project progresses, the numbers get bigger and bigger in terms of cost, uh, in terms of cost, and so the ratios get less sensitive to changes because we're dealing with bigger numbers compared to the uh, magnitude of the changes. And then you've got the to complete performance index, which, which is about a kind of measure of how how easy it is to get back get back on schedule. Um, sorry, how easy it is to get the project back on track. So these, these kind of equations, which sound, they're not as heavy as they look. They're, uh, they're incorporating fractions, basically, ratios of, of, clear, of clear numbers, clear metrics with clear meanings. And they're basically adjusting up or down based on a percentage difference or a percentage and so on. So that's the, that's the earned value. There's all these terms. And there's all these formula to practice. Unfortunately, not. It just looks heavy. It's not really that heavy. When you start to do these calculations, no. On, on previous exams, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, we haven't provided. You haven't provided the equations. But when you practice them, it will just become apparent. Like, you know, it will kind of, uh, it's nowhere near as bad as your engineering calculations. So, it should be okay. 
So I'll, I'll put the, uh, there's a tutorial next week, so I'll put that on, on Blackboard so you can see what the questions are. And it's just a little bit of practice and a little bit of clarification. Um, let's discuss things next week. I just wanted to set, set the ground, set the ground this week. I think I've got one mentimetre left. One mentimetre before we, uh, before we run for it. Somewhere. The worst case forecast of expected cost at completion. Or ten, should be, it should say tends to be in brackets. Should be, uh, to be, to be precise, I think. I think, I think we'll have, I think, I think it'd be good to answer the questions next week. So it's a kind of another tutorial session, it's a bit, a bit more, a bit more freedom to move around and talk to each other rather than uh, this kind of formal lecture type uh, setup. So the tutorial, I think next Friday, isn't it? In your, in your timetables. Yes, you're right. The 15 in the blue. Correct. Maybe I can put some more of these together next week to test you. I think it would be a good idea. So, Esther, thanks for your attention. Hope you have a nice rest of the day, rest of the week. Right. about learning how to use this stuff now. All this microphone stuff. Mute mics. Mute mics. HDMI. All this technology. Slip.